Well, th thank you so much, Tammy. Uh, there were there are so many people here who I would like to acknowledge that it would, it would take half the evening. So uh, let me just uh, acknowledge uh, Miles Rappaport, <coughs> Demos, my wife, John Fitzgerald, uh, Kit Rackless, the editor of the Prospect, and a lot of other people here who are important to me. And I thank you for coming, and I particularly thank Joe uh, for appearing with me. Uh, Joe has been here with mine for a long time. Uh, when I grow up, I'd like to be Joe Stiglitz. <laughs> uh, so debtor's prison. Uh, this has not been a very good week for the purveyors of austerity. Uh, Europe uh, went deeper into depression. Uh, there is a more pushback against Chancellor Merkel than there has been in a long time. Doesn't seem to be doing, doing much good, but at least there is pushback. Uh, we've had a real-time experiment in Europe on the folly of austerity. Uh, it was not a, a great week for the purveyors of austerity in the United States. Uh, growth. Uh, was very disappointing in the first quarter, which is exactly what you'd expect when you step on the oxygen hose. It's exactly what you'd expect when you uh, shrink uh, the deficit by $270 billion, which is what the, the combination of this sequester and the New Year's budget deal did. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office, a uh, fairly neutral arbiter, said that the combination of the two things is going to cut the growth rate in half this year. And then, uh, to, to cap things off, uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff uh, not only were uh, exposed by a graduate student at a great public university at the University of Massachusetts, but then they uh, compounded the error in a very uh, disingenuous response in the New York Times last, uh, last uh, Saturday, where they basically said this was, this was no big deal. Well, it was a huge deal because they had uh, claim that when uh, a debt ratio in a country reaches 90% uh, of GDP, uh, growth slows and other bad things happen. They, they only achieve this by leaving out what happened after World War II when all of the democracies had enormous uh, uh, debt ratios and this was on the eve of the greatest economic boom in, uh, in modern times. And um, the problem is we are, we are winning on the economics, we are not yet winning on the politics. And I, I also want to get into why that's the case. So um, the book is called Debtor's Prison because the analogy turns out to be uh, very fertile. And uh, in looking at the dynamics of austerity, I got very interested in what I came to call the double standards of debt. Uh, why is it that corporations can get rid of all debts in a Chapter 11 proceeding? that then gives them a clean slate and a fresh start and the ability to incur new debts and go on with their businesses going concerns. But homeowners cannot. Um, <coughs> students, former students who now have a trillion dollars of debt cannot. And small countries cannot. <coughs> and um, my study of this, uh, guided in part by two other heroes, uh, Elizabeth Warren, who came to prominence as a student of debt and of, of, of the double standards of bankruptcy. And uh, she turns out to be married to the great historian of, of bankruptcy, Bruce Mann, who also teaches at the Harvard Law School. And in doing research on this, I found my way back uh, to the year 1692, when a young failed merchant named Daniel Defoe uh, found himself in debtor's prison because he owed more than 100 creditors uh, more than 10,000 pounds, which was a lot of money in those days. And um, he became the first pamphleteer advocating the idea that wouldn't it be better for both the creditor and the debtor if both could appear before a magistrate and the creditor could declare the value of his assets and his assets could be divided among uh, the creditors and then he could have a fresh start rather than languishing in debtor's prison where he could never get out from under. It took about um, 13 years for Queen Anne's ministers to realize this was a good idea. They decided this was a good idea not because of a sudden attack of social compassion, but because uh, half of the British merchant class was in jail 
<laughs> and it was in jail uh, not because uh, of improvidence on their part, but because of wars with France and bubonic plague and um, the fact that a terrible tempest had sunk half of the merchant fleet. And even though modern macroeconomics was not a concept in the, in the 1690s, wasn't invented until the 1930s, uh, they realized that if half of the commercial class was in debtor's prison, the whole economy would implode. And so in 1706, the first modern bankruptcy law passed the British Parliament. But, interestingly enough, it was only for merchants. Uh, ordinary deadbeats had no uh, impact, so they thought, on the macroeconomy. And so they could stay in jail, whereas merchants could uh, go through this process. And even Defoe, poor guy, he couldn't qualify. Uh, he managed to get out of prison. He fled to Scotland and decided that maybe he could seek his fortune as a writer and uh, later became one of the first best-selling authors uh, with a novel called Robinson Crusoe. So this was the origin of, uh, of bankruptcy. <clears throat> and what's interesting is that the double standard of debt was there right at the creation. And so fast forward 300 years, uh, if you're a corporation executive, you can declare Chapter 11, you can get out from under the pensions that you owe your workers and retirees, uh, the banks, by the way, airlines were, were particularly uh, notorious. Every major airline has been in and out of Chapter 11. And the banks have liens on the planes. So they get in line to get paid uh, ahead of the workers and the pensioners. And um, the use of bankruptcy is notorious in private equity hostile takeovers, leverage buyouts, where you, uh, you, you take the company bankrupt, you, you cut the wages, cut the pensions, uh, get rid of the debts, and then you pocket a lot of the profit and start over. The, the private equity industry, by the way, is a complete misnomer. It ought to be called private debt. Uh, the, these guys don't contribute much equity. They mainly uh, leverage the company up through the use of debt. So uh, the double standards have been there uh, for a long time. And they interact with, with budgetary austerity to create a, a prolonged uh, low-level depression. I've, I've tried to wean others in the press from the habit of calling this uh, the Great Recession. It's not a Great Recession. It's a prolonged deflation. Uh, it's a low-level uh, depression because a recession is something that's short-lived and uh, cured by fiscal and monetary policy. Uh, a debt deflation is a different animal entirely. And what we have is a not quite so bad version of what we had uh, during the Great Depression, and, and Europe has worse. Now, there's a very instructive connection between uh, the debt deflation that we're in and the double standards of debt relief and income inequality that Joe Stiglitz gets at in, in his book on the subject. And the connection is this. It's really a three-way connection. We've had 30 years of flat or declining wages for ordinary people. And during those 30 years, this was a period of financial deregulation where banks and investment banks and other shadow bankers were permitted to invent all kinds of opaque, toxic instruments that allowed people to borrow against assets. And so you had the creation of an asset bubble and people whose incomes were declining felt rich because the value of their assets, typically their homes, was increasing. And so the banks with these toxic instruments were enablers of a lot of household borrowing. Uh, Demos has done a lot of wonderful work on this, exposing this. And in effect, debt was substituted for income. There's a British political economist named Colin Crouch who calls this privatized Keynesianism. You rely on the household sector to pump up aggregate demand by going into debt. And the banking sector also goes into debt by using short-term money market borrowing to finance the speculation in these toxic instruments. Now, the problem with privatized Keynesianism, and I, I apologize for uh, Icano's speak here, is that it's pro-cyclical. Just when you don't want it to go nuts on the upside, it goes nuts on the upside. And then, when you need creditors to stick around on the downside, everybody runs for the exits. 
So it makes booms more unsustainable and it makes busts worse. The difference between privatized Keynesianism and real Keynesianism is that when the government does the borrowing, it can be counter-cyclical. And this is a time when we need counter-cyclical borrowing and public investment to compensate for the shortfall in private spending in the, in the aftermath of the bust. So the problem is that if you look at the politics of this, we ought to be talking about uh, public investment, more stimulus. We ought to be talking about debt relief so that homeowners and students and former students and not just uh, corporations and small countries can get out from under the, the, the heel of, of debt. But instead, the entire elite is obsessing on public sector debt. This was how Reinhardt and Rogoff disgraced themselves. And this is the Peterson Foundation, and this is yeah. the terrible convergence of uh, where President Obama and the Republicans, who agree on just about nothing else, both agree that nothing would be so good uh, for the economy as a lot more retrenchment. They're just arguing about the details. Um, and I, I'm reminded, I, I have an essay in the New York Review this week where, where I invoked uh, the Tom Stoppard uh, play, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead, where these two minor characters from Hamlet usurp center stage, and all the action on the stage is about them, and Hamlet is off stage. And this is what's happened with the debate about debt. We ought to be talking about relief of these uh, disabling debts that put all of us in debtor's prison, and instead we're obsessing on the public debt, which is the one kind of debt that can be virtuous in, in current economic uh, circumstances. Uh, the book spends about a third of the text on why austerity has taken root in the United States. It spends about a third on why it's taken root in Europe, despite Europe's very different history and uh, institutional uh, uh, factors. And then a third of it is on, on the history of uh, debt and the double standards of debt. Now, let me just take a moment to talk a little bit about Europe. Um, the story of our era, as far as Europe is concerned, is a story of the steady weakening of social democracy in Europe. And uh, if you go back to the founding of the, the predecessor institutions of the European Union, the, the original European <coughs> Economic Community of the Treaty of Rome in 1957, in that era, you had strong nation states that were strong enough to create full employment economies and regulate capital. And the role of the state was to do that. I mean, if, 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 if Britain, in the aftermath of World War II, which just was a, a catastrophic for Britain, much more damaging than for the United States, but if a labor government got elected in 1945 and that labor government wanted to enact <coughs> national health insurance, it could do so. If the French wanted to nationalize the banks, they could do so. If various uh, European nations wanted to have uh, strong unions as social partners, they could do so. The, so the, the social democratic uh, part of the, the European project was based in strong states with parliamentary systems. Meanwhile, in order to overcome the fragmentation of lots of little countries uh, in one continent, the um, customs union part was the, the European Economic Community. And this was also anchored in a stable monetary system, initially under the Bretton Woods system, and then a little later with the Deutschmark as, as the anchor currency. After the 1980s, something bad happens to this system. Uh, first of all, in all of the major countries, uh, neoliberalism becomes the ascendant ideology, and the ostensible center-left parties are almost as bad as the center-right party. It's Gerhard Schroeder, a social democrat, who, who dismantles the more stable uh, German model. Uh, it's Tony Blair who decides that he's going to keep a lot of Thatcherism intact and uh, going to try to run Britain as a kind of uh, a financial economy and just let manufacturing go. And um, by the 90s, you have the Maastricht Treaty, which privileges the free movement of finance, of 
goods, of services, and of people. And the balance tips, so this carefully constructed uh, mixed economy tips in favor of an ultra-free market economy. And I found a quote from 1939 by an enthusiast of European federalism, and the quote is as follows. Uh, with European Federation, certain economic powers, which are now generally wielded by the national state, would be exercised by neither the Federation nor the state. <clears throat> In other words, uh, European Federation would weaken the ability of the state to regulate capitalism in, in favor of what Joe was called a, a managed form of capitalism. Now, the guy who said that was one uh, Friedrich Hayek. And Hayek was the great libertarian, the great opponent of government. Hayek was very far-sighted. He knew that uh, European Federation would weaken the ability of governments to regulate markets. And because of the peculiar self-interest of the Germans, who have acted uh, as the enforcer of austerity, uh, the EU is undermining the ability of the state to regulate the market, and it is worse uh, pursuing this austerity course. Now, the, the great exception to the period of uh, double standards of debt is the period of the 1930s and the 1940s. This was a harmonic convergence of capitalism having disgraced itself and Roosevelt having gotten elected president and pursuing all kinds of policies of, of debt relief and macroeconomic stimulus. And then on top of that, you have the war, which was the greatest uh, unintended recovery program of all time. Uh, we had debt, uh, deficits of 26% uh, on average for the four war years, and uh, very strong trade unions, both because of the Wagner Act and because of the policies of the War Labor Board, where if, if you wanted a government contract, you had to respect the rights of your workers to unionize. And similarly in Europe, we had a harmonic convergence in that the right has been totally discredited, both by the Depression and by the alliance of a lot of big business people with fascism. So the whole period after the war is a period of managed capitalism delivering the goods for ordinary people, and it's a period of debt relief. And one of the most important acts of debt relief of that era occurred in 1948, when the Allies, in order to help Germany recover, wrote off 93% of the Hitler debt the German debt to GDP ratio was 675%. And the Allies, in order to help Germany recover, having learned the lessons of Versailles, where the German economy was destroyed through draconian reparations policies, not just because they read Keynes and, 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 and were, were kinder, gentler, but because the Cold War had started and they needed a strong West Germany to be their, their Cold War allies. But whatever the motivation, this was history's great act of macroeconomic mercy. And so it is a particularly bitter irony that it is Germany who is the enforcer of austerity on the rest of Europe. Uh, whatever fudging of their budgets the Greeks did, the Nazis did worse. <laughs> and it would be an act of grace for the Germans to say, you know, maybe we ought to take our foot off the oxygen hose and let these economies recover. But instead, Germany, as the most powerful creditor nation, is using its leverage to do uh, just the opposite. So I think our side of this argument wins on the history. We win on the economics. We don't seem to be winning on the politics. And I think the reason that we don't win on the politics is that the one thing that connects austerity economics in, uh, in Europe and austerity economics in finance is what you might call the primacy of, of finance. Uh, the two systems are very different. What they have in common is that banks have an inordinate amount of economic power, uh, despite the efforts of, uh, of our friends uh, Frank and Dodd. Uh, the Dodd-Frank bill is being uh, eviscerated at the level of regulation, uh, or deregulation, uh, in, in rulemakings. And uh, the business model of the banks is basically unchanged in all of its fundamentals. And the political power of the banks is unchanged. 
And I think, tragically, 2008 will be re remembered as one of history's great missed moments, where finance was disgraced in, in 2008 um, the same way it was disgraced in 1929, but for whatever reasons, uh, Barack Obama did not turn out to be Franklin Roosevelt. There's a, there's a quote that I often cite by the British historian uh, A.J.P. Taylor, who was a historian of 19th century Europe, and uh, Taylor was writing about the revolutionary year 1848, where liberal nationalist revolutions broke out all over Central Europe, and within a year, all of them were crushed by the powerful empires of that period. And Taylor wrote, uh, it was a turning point of history, but history didn't turn. <laughs> and in many ways, uh, that describes the fall of 2008 and uh, the years that follow, and so it's our job to make sure that history turns. Uh, all of my books seem to end with the same last paragraph. <laughs> uh, it, it's not because I'm lazy, it's because I keep pushing the rock up the same hill. And the last paragraph is, of course, we have to take back our politics. And that's what Demos tries to do, that's what Roosevelt tries to do, that's what Joe and I try to do, and it's a real honor to have uh, the privilege of introducing Joe Stiglitz. Thank you so much.